the only podcast without a logo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rex, and I have confidence in the singularity of our name. I, Fun Killer Chronicle. I, I'm Beth, and I am still very confused as how you have a chronicle, but but that's what we're doing. We are chronicling, and I'm D-Day, and I designed the logo and the assets, and you can't get the logo online anymore. You can only get our logo if you're one of our patrons on Patreon. And our incredible theme song is created by Lizard McGee from the band Earwig. Um, I don't know if you guys have had the chance yet to check him out on Bandcamp or his uh, band out on Bandcamp, but they're really fucking awesome. They are. And he and I are friends on Twitter. And if you would like to be our friends on Twitter, look at me and Lizard McGee being friends on Twitter. They are <laughs> such adorable, awful friends on Twitter. Uh -huh. me, because everything Lizard on Twitter McGee, is awful. Yeah. So it's been a minute since we have been recording. Remind me what it is that we're recording. Well, we are recording episode four of the Fun Killer Chronicle, where we are going to talk about chapters 48 through 66. Thank you for remembering Name that. of the Wind. Yay! Uh, uh, we're, we're doing 47? 46, 47? Hang on, I got my notes. <laughs> D-Day, why don't you tell us about uh, what happened in... Chapter 47, either for the first time or again. Well, I have to give us uh, a, a back up to speed because um, people haven't been uh, listening to us for a month already now. I'm pretty sure they can just skip forward in these episodes. But, but please, sum up. All right. So after uh, the last, last depressing section where Kvothe and Tarbine, there was the last section, which was uplifting, where uh, Kvothe goes to school and gets whipped. And makes an enemy of the richest, douchiest, rich douche in all of Wizard University. That's our previously on? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Previously on the first half of the book. And now... Chapter 47. Barbs. Kvothe studies everything, but mostly he studies under Kilvin. Does he have friends? He does. And some of them <laughs> help start spread... <laughs> He does. <laughs> and some of them help him start spreading legends about him, because as we know, he's already got more than a number of rumors floating around about him. Kvothe and Ambrose butt heads often, which is no bueno, especially because Kvothe underestimates Ambrose. Butt heads. Well, I'm so sorry, listeners, that we did not include that succinct summary of chapter 47 in episode three. Please you totally would have remembered that had I ever read that in front of you before. Forgive us <laughs> our trespasses. And now... Like, I just know that if we ended last episode with me saying buttheads twice in, in two sentences, one sentence of which is just buttheads, you would have called me out for that. May I give you a line that I think uh, summarizes this chapter? Yeah. Like a dog too stupid to avoid a porcupine. Mm-hmm. Oh, I know a dog like that. I know several. <laughs> Porcupines, skunks. <laughs> skunks are a snack. Skunkupines. Skunkupines. In in our fantasy world, we will have skunkupines. Oh. Chapter 48, Interlude. A silence of a different kind. Fourth silence? What is it? Why isn't Quoth talking? <laughs> Bast isn't afraid of many things. But he does fear the deep, weary silence that sometimes gathers around them like an invisible shroud. Quoth finally speaks. He's not sure what to tell next in his story. So Quoth says he has to take care of body things. So he prepares a bunch of food for them to eat, then eats almost none of it himself. Bast points out that we haven't passed the Bechdel test I yet in this that. narrative. That's so accurate. Like, hey... Do you remember women? More women in your story? It seems like a lacking of women. Yeah, I've story. written <laughs> I've written fully half a book already. And uh <laughs> you've should only... really put some women in here. I'll have a character mention that there's gonna be. <laughs> Man. Quoth says, Don't you worry, there will be ladies. But will they talk to each other? Will they talk to each other about not a man? <laughs> will they we even be in the same scene? Uh, only if, like, Kvothe is someplace and he sees Denna across the way talking to Fela and imagines them not talking about him. <laughs> Chapter 49, The Nature of Wild Things. Let's talk about Denna, shall we? 
we shan't. <laughs> but, 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 but Rex will, and we'll have to wait our turn mm, until we promised. get to that. What we can talk about now is how Quoth is poor, and also it's time for the next semester's admissions. Quoth does have to pay tuition this term, and it's more than he's got. He's off to Emory to shady scrounge some more money and get back by tomorrow noon, or else, oh no. What do you think he's going to do, guys? Shady shit. Is he going to pick some pockets? Is he going to turn some tricks? Oh, man, he could, too. He's going to go to Copperhawks, Shimgals, or Let's? Shimgals. Shimgals. Copperhawks, by the way, is... I really appreciate that for money lenders. Like, Copperhawk. Yeah. Copperhawk! I mean, if one of the... Copperhawk! Okay. <laughs> yes? <laughs> Nothing doing there. No, no, you, you won that round. Chapter 50, Negotiations. Imre is Wizard University's college town. There's no love lost between them, but there is a river between them. So, you can see what I did there. Imre is the haven for the performing arts, and Quoth has only been there once because he couldn't bear to be around performers and not perform. So, he goes to a moneylender. Uh, pause. It's a haven for the arts because... An appreciative, affluent audience, which is said much like a working artist. You know, a, an appreciative audience is great, but um, paying rent on the theater, now that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Go on. Yeah, otherwise, if you want to make money being an artist, you have to produce your own shows and you have to illegally sell your own drinks. If you don't illegally sell your own drinks, oh, you're you not won't make money on money. your show. Nah. Sell your own drinks Ill illegally. That's the only way. That's how spending like five months and $9,000 doing theater in the Bay Area will do you. You'll make 9000 and maybe $150 more than that back. You know what's also really great <laughs> is if you can get like a 10% kickback from the Coke dealer. The Coke brothers. Yeah. Go to the Coke brothers and ask them for money for our show. It's not, Can you just mute his mic? It's not a rave. It's theater. <laughs> How do you stay awake through plays? You're going to need Molly so you like it. And stay awake. Coke will just make you restless. You shouldn't do Coke at theater. I'm really going to have to change the uh, content warning on these episodes. <laughs> Chapter 50, Negotiations. Oh, gosh, we're going forward so fast. No, 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 no. no I'm going back. Ah. <laughs> D-Day very much likes to tell his whole story twice. Because our right. episodes aren't long enough already. No, it's because he knows he'll cut out the one that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do editing too. Imre is a Wizard University's college town. There's no love lost between them, but there is a river between them. So you can hear Beth's laugh from the last time I said, <laughs> so you can see what I did there. Imre you don't is get the it twice. <laughs> insert rim shot. <laughs> Imre is the haven for the performing arts, and Quoth has only been there once because he couldn't bear to be around performers and not be performing. So he goes to a moneylender, Devi. Devi drives a hard bargain, and on top of her vig, she also demands one, two, three drops of blood. Quoth is like, fuck you! Not with that magic you got, no way, not today. So he leaves, buys a secondhand loot from a pawn shop, and returns to Debbie sometime later to make a deal with the Debbie, which he does. Oof. He returns to school that night, laden with loot two ways. Oof. Chapter 51, Tar and Tin. Quoth is fisheried up, and what he does there is he learns Sigildry, which is a new magic we learn about, which is, for once, simple to explain. Sigildry is putting runes on objects, what to do magic, to the objects and stuff. Basic role-playing game crafting, it seems. But it turns out it's a very hard thing to do, like... And to say. I, I've said Sigildry right three times now. Beth? Wait, are you going to prove I can't say it? I can't say it. S Sigildry. Oh. That was fine. In one. I thought you might stumble over Sigildry. Well, don't worry if I ever have to get back to it. Yeah, if she has to say it. <laughs> DJ, please continue telling us about Sigildry. Okay, so Sigildry is just like the tacked on crafting that they throw into every goddamn game. Um, but it turns out in this world, it is a very hard thing to do. Like much harder than just doing things the standard way and like not 
putting magic in them at all in the first place. Oh, I love that series where he explains. Uh, you can stick a thing to a thing, thing this way, but just like fucking like wrap it can, with wire. You can make mason masonry. Uh, masonry, yeah, yeah. You yeah. can make masonry, but in order to do it with sigle, god damn it, sigle tree. <laughs> Uh, I just laid that mine for you. That's full of gold tree mine. Sickle tree. S- sick- God damn it, it's completely gone down. I just point at me and I'll say sickle tree. <laughs> um, the, there's, there's just that beautiful paragraph where Quoth explains how difficult the art of sickle tree is. And uh, she's saying sickle tree for some reason. <laughs> damn. But that, that like actual doing mason masonry is easier which i i don't know as someone who works in the arts where often you spend way too much time building something fake that looks like something that you could have built Mm -hmm. uh it really rings true to me it's like well yeah you could do this this way but it would be stupid yeah don't oh no we trapped josh in the bathroom can someone help him out (laughs) (laughs) that that, that chair is totally blocking (laughs) sorry <laughs> Sorry. All right. First, I bust in on you, <laughs> and then, we and then I, put a, you in the yeah, I put a chair in front of your door. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> he he was blocking that door with the like smallest portion of that chair he could have managed. There was like a an eighth of an inch overhang in it. I'm like, very <laughs> subtle. <laughs> Both is an A plus whiz student, but he is still a musical genius who finds time between classes to practice his lute, do some parkour, and <laughs> it's free running. And I really wish you'd take the time to learn the difference. <laughs> yeah, I won't. <laughs> um, so in between classes, he practices his uh, his stringed instrument. He does some uh, free running. Yeah. That's and right. pursues a mysterious <laughs> apple carrying someone to a dead end consisting of a rune enchanted grate in an isolated courtyard. Mysterious. Mysterious. Mysterious and like humid. <laughs> Feels very humid to me. Uh, I read through that section twice patty rots does not like say anything explicitly to make me feel how humid i feel when i read that section. i i would like to point out that patty rots totally standalone novella, novella uh-huh. that is about that character is all between <coughs> this chapter and the next time we run into her no shit yeah the whole thing just in case wow. you are people who have read that, that's the... Which, which we will get to... I'm keeping that in mind. In just a couple of chapters, and then again, maybe in between these books? Or well, I mean, we should probably book. do it, like, when it's we'll supposed do it. to happen. Well, yeah, well, I mean, we can't pause and stop here, but after we yeah, go through... Like no, I mean, when it's section. supposed to happen for the three of us. Oh. Like, you know, I manifest it. Like, yeah, like when, it, when, it, emotionally it, when it comes... Up yeah. when it presents itself as the thing we're doing, <laughs> yeah. As we do it, sorry, go on. I'm, God, so I'm not looking forward to summarizing that. Grow, that Ori one's... does a bunch of stuff. Does she <laughs> swim places? She does, and she finds things there. Did sometimes she, she takes die? them, sometimes she doesn't. Did she almost die? Maybe, but like, maybe not. Maybe Mo- she's a god or some shit. Mostly we don't know. she's cataloging a series of underground tunnels, but it's cool, it's cool. Sorry, we'll we'll get back to that. Go on, D-Day. <laughs> Later, Quoth learns magical making things from Manet or Manet. I think Manet. Manet. M- Manet. Later, Quoth learns magical making things from Manet, but there are really hard magical machines that Quoth doesn't know how to make yet. But he will in time. But there is no time! <laughs> Whoa. Wow. Jesus. You, uh... But there is no time! I feel like you're reading these at a different pace than I am. <laughs> uh, it's just really driving home the fact that uh, Patrick Rothfuss does this thing, um, especially when he's foreshadowing, especially at the end of chapters where he's like, and wouldn't it be nice if X, Y, and Z, but not Z! <laughs> and X and Y go all wrong. 
Yeah, I feel like at the beginning and end of chapters in this section, he often does like theatery things like she's standing in the wings waiting for their entrance. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> that, I, I just want to tag that because it does kind of bring up a, an interesting thing about the framing, which is that this is all a single spoken narrative, uh, ostensibly, except for the in- interludes. Except for the interludes. So when he finishes a, a chapter with that sentence he's immediately progressing on to the top sentence of the next chapter he's like created for you a thesis of the next thrust of the narrative it's uh very interesting it is very interesting (laughs) just because i sound sarcastic and And that to be sarcastic doesn't mean that was sarcastic it's it's not just the tone we're all used to the tone it's the uh it's the (laughs) smile the rictus smile let's say fixed Dry, yeah. <clears throat> um, your your poor teeth. Uh, most of them aren't mine. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter fifty two, burning. Quoth is busy, 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 but he's not so busy that he neglects regaining his skill on the loot. He hangs out with Willem and Simon, who give him shit about not hanging out. Quoth hasn't told them about how much debt he has and how he has to constantly work at school and work to financially survive to financially survive. We learn a bunch about Elk Sadal and his temperament and how he runs his classroom, which Rex will get into. But the important thing that we are going to talk about is the magical dueling, which, of course, Quoth is the undefeatedest at. I I really loved this take on Quidditch. I mean, like, the, we all know that JK no, is the OG. Actual, no, they there's do. actual magical dueling. Yeah, and Harry it's Potter. like fucking pistols at high noon yeah. and it sucks. <clears throat> yeah. you, you're, you're wrong. Quidditch is still the football. Yeah, but Quidditch <laughs> is better than the magical dueling in Harry Potter. The magical dueling in Harry Potter sucks. It's like one, two, three, shoot. Yes. Well, sometimes it's one, two, three, shoot beams of power. And then we'll just hold these for a while Mm -hmm. while we think about our pasts. And then I'm like, Patronus! And they're like, (laughs) Ex Machina! And it's like, pew, pew! And it sucks. But this doesn't suck. This is like (laughs) fucking incredible machine conceptual, like, billiards chess. I love it. And Quoth is the best at it because he's the smartest boy. He, you know what it is? It's it's simultaneous arm wrestling and foot wrestling. I think it's or arm, arm wrestling, wrestling and, and a, thumb wrestling. It's yeah. arm wrestling in a spelling bee. <laughs> it's arm wrestling in a spelling bee on a Sibian. Arm wrestling. Ooh, this got more exciting. Well, I'm just saying, like, you got to get your energy from somewhere. <laughs> and I use orgone energy. Don't tell anyone about the organ boxes in the backyard. <laughs> well, I mean, they'll find out if the virus will ever go away and we can have the shows I built all that stuff for. <laughs> oh, man, I can't wait until people see our cloud busting. <laughs> I've gotten so good at it. I'm sorry. Uh, please continue. <laughs> oh, no, this is actually all in my script. <laughs> <laughs> So both digress into Wilhelm Reich for two minutes. <laughs> I'm going to keep doing it. This is the only show that we have where I can consistently talk about orgone energy. <laughs> All right. So, um, Quoth Duel Sventon. And like, Quoth Duel Sventon? We'll, we'll talk about the duel in a second. But like, when I read the name of Fenton, I know Fenton is going to lose. Aww. Quoth didn't duel Galahad. Quoth dueled Fenton. Aww, Fenton. So Quoth duels name. Fenton was pretty good. He was the next best. It's just Quoth is so Fenton put up a baller fight. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Fenton is good. <laughs> but, but Fenton's named Fenton. He's not named, you know, Fenton the Bloodless. <laughs> <laughs> He's Fenton like the newspaper reader, and sometimes he does the crossword puzzle. He's Fenton, who uh, apparently really does not like getting stood up, stood up for corners. Oh, is that that Fenton? That's that Fenton. I, oh. I assume, unless uh, maybe Fenton's a real common name. 
<laughs> maybe, maybe Fenton is the Jason. <laughs> Magic oh. you. Oh man, we can't keep all of this in in this chapter, but this is some gold digression, guys. All right. Um Quoth duels Fenton on candles with wick versus straw. No source modifier. Quoth is going to lose at lighting Fenton's candle while keeping his candle unlit. And he's also going to lose his last two jots through the class's secret gambling, which is unequivocally awesome. Like, imagine if we had gambling at gym class. What school did you go to? <laughs> a school where we didn't have gambling. Oh, in gym man, I made so much money taking a flop on the rope. <laughs> Fenton almost dies because he used too much of his body heat in too stupid of a way to try to light Quoth's candle. Turns out everyone can be stupid with magic, not just Quoth. Class is over. Elksa Dahl knows Quoth just made a big return on his apparently not-so-secret bet, and everyone knows that Quoth is working himself to a very early grave, and his friends work with Kilvin to make him stop working so hard in the fishery by not allowing him in the fishery. Which is nice. Yeah, it was sweet, weird behavior. That, that is a, it's a good way to, to cut down on somebody's overwork to yep. just... Yeah, no, go home. Ability to do so. Yeah, it's not at all an abusive thing to decide that someone is working too hard in there and take away one of their jobs for them. It's cool. It's friendship. Mm -hmm. Can be. They knew. They knew better. It's... They knew right. Yeah. And they also know. In this case, it look. It seems like they did. Yeah. 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 And they also know what the Weird Aeolian is. Oh, the Aeolian. Aeolian? How do you uh, say it? Uh, I don't pronounce e words that start with E-O generally. <laughs> uh, that would, it, it's, it's Yolian. Wouldn't that start with a Y? No. Uh, Yolian? Um, the only word I know that is spelled like that and actually has a, uh, it's got a direct parallel is Yolan, which is from Yolan Harp. Um, oh, it's actually, it's spelled exactly like that. It's uh, Eolian Harp. I'm going to need that phonetically. I'm, I'm going to see if I can get my phone to, to say it. That's <laughs> not what I asked for. <laughs> it's a Eolian. lot of work. One more time. Eolian. Isn't that what I said? Eolian? Eolian. 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 The real nerds amongst us will remember. Uh, that like a minute ago, I said the Eolian. Shut up. You were saying Aeolian like it was a, a fucking mayonnaise dressing. No, that starts with an A. <laughs> uh, the nerdiest amongst us will remember uh, stupid Kevin Sorbo's sidekick, Yolus. Nope. From uh, Hercules. Hercules, the legendary fascist. Yeah. In that horrible show, <laughs> our fascist had a sidekick called Aeolus, who is the Greek god of the wind. And a Aeolian harp is uh, a building size structure with uh, cabling run down it that uh, sounds tones when the wind blows across it. Some of us may have seen one at a certain I, desert event. Yes, that's that's lovely. Uh -huh. Is that why you know how to pronounce that? Yes. Not just because you were like a latchkey kid during the time when fucking... Uh, Hercules, it's the legendary journey. <laughs> no. Sam Raimi wrote and directed a lot of those episodes. Uh, I have a big place in my heart for Sam Raimi, but that. Yeah, Greeks are was... not blonde. Hashtag <laughs> Greeks are not blonde. Hashtag Greek pride. Hashtag swarthy AF. Chapter 53 Slow Circles. The Aeolian. Thank you is where making the band or the voice or the X Factor or American Idol happens in the King Killer Chronicle. It is Imre's hottest venue, and like everything that could give Quoth a leg up in life, there is a financial barrier to entry that he must clear to get on stage. So he's going to earn his proverbial and literal talent pipes there and unlock the bard class for his character build. <laughs> <laughs> also, there are rich douches. So many. Yeah. yeah. I mean, rich douches love art. So we're going, is he, is he dual class now? Or are we, are we talking like spell singer? 
Bard wizard? I mean, yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but we don't know what color wizard yet. I'm thinking red or blue. Cut to Kvothe in the. <laughs> <laughs> also, there are rich douches. Fine, I'll take it back. Cut to Kvothe in the courtyard about to practice his loot, but instead we meet Ori, the mysterious Travis who lives in the walls of the main. <laughs> Condemn Ori to that. Condemn Ori to that. D don't minimize Travis. Travis could be an Ori. Oh, Travis is our friend in the walls, listeners. We can't <laughs> hang out with him because of the COVID, but he can still come over and fix the inside of the walls, and he has been doing so. His hair isn't nearly floaty enough, although he will live on apples and songs. Yeah, and he yeah. is extremely scrawny. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. often the things he says are more poetry than sense. Yeah, and Ori doesn't have a rat tail. <laughs> and he brings over trash gifts. Oh, he does. That's like his a, signature thing. He like brought over like a big now. box of <laughs> trash gifts yesterday. <laughs> And we still have that linoleum that I told him several times we didn't want. And I finally oh. fixed that chase lounge in the yard. Oh, this recontextualizes Ori for me in such a good way. Yeah, no, she's a really good Travis. Yeah, she's a Travis. And she lives in the walls of the mains. She's an ex-student or a fairy or something. And Quoth draws her to him like the little prince befriends his fox. They have a very playful rapport. And Quoth gives her food. And she gives him a key that unlocks the moon, which is normal. That's and handy. Totally handy. Yeah. Oh, my God. I would totally use the moon as a stash. <laughs> <laughs> I keep all Come on my in, cops. keys up there. Uh, never let the, even if you don't have a stash, never let the cops in. The cops can drop a stash wherever the fuck they want. <laughs> even if you don't have a stash. Quoth gives her food. She gives him a key that unlocks the moon. And he practices for his showdown at the Aeolian in front of her. It's really more of a hoedown than a showdown, but. <laughs> Chapter 54, A Place to Burn. Will and Sim are giving Quoth more shit because they still don't know what he's spending all his time doing or who he's spending it with. But we now know the who and where and what, and it's Ori in the courtyard with the candlestick. Lame reference complete, moving on. <sighs> Wow. Well, I was going to say something with moon, but we just talked about moon, so everyone knows what a candlestick is for. Go on. <laughs> it is Lead e pipe. <laughs> it is Aeolian time at the Aeolian with Quoth and the kids. Willem does toxic masculinity at Quoth and Sim's drink orders. Girls. It's gross. And Quoth is going to try to play one of the most difficult loot songs imaginable and he doesn't even have someone to sing along with him. Uh, hi, I'm Kvothe. I'm going to be playing the Black Page. <laughs> I'm going to be accompanying myself on drums. And Kvothe is all full of himself, but the owners seem to like him because I'm sure Kvothe is being very presentational in his uh, egotism and, uh, and his easy banter. Kvothe is performing Kvothe. Oh, very much so. Well, I mean, you kind of do when you step into a theater or a venue, like, or I kind of do. Um, it's a sickness. <laughs> Everyone knows it's a sickness, but like, it's a real easy, comfortable sickness. Come see me at a show sometime. D-Day enters every performance space cape first. It, it's not that hard. <laughs> it's not that hard for me to like, you know, amble around with an easy gait. But like, if you want to see me stride into a fucking room, there better be an audience. The owners seem to like Quoth, which makes sense because Quoth was raised a capital P performer. You know who else performs? Ambrose. And here he is at the and here he is at the Aeolian, being one of the rich douches who is here at the Aeolian. He plays liar, and we just know that Quoth is about to rip his shit right up. A lot of talented people play, but no one who tries to get their talent pipes gets their pipes. And then finally, it's Quoth's turn. He does his super hard song, The Lay of Sir Savian Tralliard, which requires a duet. And serendipitously, there is a female voiced person in the audience who eventually joins in. Quoth kills it. He kills it so hard that a string breaking mid song only helps him kill it even harder. His mind retreats to where he was the last time we read about Quoth playing a lute with broken strings when he wandered the woods playing songs of the names of the world. 
He finishes the song in that state, resurfaces, and breaks down in tears with his face in his hands. Most cry protagonist. I think this is like the fourth big cry. He's uh, still a child. He, here is here is your uh, <laughs> no, your antidote to Will's toxic masculinity. Crying is healthy, yeah. D Day. You cry. You cry when you create things. No, it's okay to cry. Not just cried. Cried on stage. Aww. Like a hero. Chapter fifty five. Flame and thunder. Here comes the musician's self doubt, followed by the audience sobbing, followed by the thunderous applause. Such a good chapter. Chapter 56, Patrons, Maids, and Methaglin. The impenetrable stanchion meets Quoth on stage and slips him his talent pipes, which Quoth shows the audience and results in more applause. Quoth and Co. drink with stanchion before we meet Count Threep. He gives Quoth some coin, and we learn from him that the song Quoth just played was at least peripherally about the Amir. Really? Yeah. God, I'm bad at this. How so? <laughs> uh, Sir Savian um, is an Amir. Is he? That's he what says 3PO it. says. Yeah. Holy shit. Oh, have you not been reading it that way the whole time? Uh, you'll hear what I've been reading it as <laughs> next chapter. <laughs> no, I am... Okay, so... So we meet Count Threep. So the thing that... that Quoth and Denner are always quoting back and forth to each other is about an Amir. And yes. so that's their first song is the like la lost love of an Amir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But is it not the story that we heard of the two people who were in love and he tried to call her back from the dead and then he went crazy? No, no. that's the different epic song. There's a uh, lot of epic song poems. <laughs> Post songs. <laughs> that's Fair. that's the origin story of Haliax. Okay. Okay, okay. All right. Everyone's a name here. Go on. Mm -hmm. We meet Count Threep. He gives Quoth some coin, and we learn from him that the song Quoth just played was at least peripherally about the Amir. Quoth gets fawned over, gets some more coin, and then gets the creeping suspicion that Ambrose sapped his own body heat to magically fucker somebody named Quoth's loot string. Whoa! You'd think that's a plot point, but Ambrose? I don't believe it's ever mentioned again. Moving on, Quoth doesn't recognize he's being flirted with, like I don't recognize when I'm being flirted with, but Quoth is also single-minded in finding the lady who sang with him, and then that's what happens. He does find her, and that's who she is. <laughs> Chapter 57, Interlude, The Parts That Form Us. Are the parts that form us silences? Let's see. Uh, no, I think mostly it's like blood, bones, and stuff. Best wants Quoth to get on with it. Quoth wants to describe her right. Turns out Bast met her once, and also Bast has an ear thing for ears, but not uh, the rest of her face thing for the rest of her face. I would like to point out that Patty Rothfuss has an ear thing for <laughs> ears. Bast is only one of the few characters that has an ear thing for ears. And it's just saying Patty Rothfuss is into ears. What makes you say that? Have you seen another instance of ears? Oh, yes. Not, not in reference to Denna. Yes. I feel like yes. I feel like the answer to that is yes. Fila's got some thick lobes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And they're not connected. Ooh, a... <laughs> love me a detached lobe. All right. Please, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> How you make ears sound so unsexy. Quoth describes the draw of Denna, realizes Chronicler has been taking notes and makes him start over because Quoth is a stickler for accuracy and leaving deleted scenes deleted. Quoth corrects himself and tells Chronicler that Denna was beautiful, but not just beautiful. She's like beautiful, beautiful. And Quoth doesn't just think so. Other folks think so too. Chapter 58, Names for Beginning. And here is Denna. She's a proverbial diamond in the rough trade that's been throwing themselves in front of Quoth. I, I don't like what you did there. Uh, I don't particularly like it either, but once uh, I did that, I couldn't figure out how to make it better, and I tried a couple times, so I left it how it was. 
It's totally not a trope how Quoth freezes and lets the camera pan over her with its soft focus and male gaziness. Oof. He, well, he goes out of the way to be like, oh, and it's not like, you know, in the stories where the thing that's about to happen doesn't happen. It's just like, it's, it's the other thing that happens. <laughs> Either there's soft focus and you stride over and you're confident or there's soft focus and you stand there and you look like a fool. <laughs> Quoth does the latter. Smiles are exchanged as are metaphors for Quoth's cold and brittle feelings. <laughs> they do manners at each other. Quoth feels poor some more again. And then an old guy plays um, a... <clears throat> They do manners at one another. They do manners at one another. Now you. They do manners at one another. Thank you. Quoth feels poor some more. And then an old guy plays a rare court flute. And Quoth is enamored with Denna. So he only has eyes for Denna. And he has no eyes for the rare court flute. Loot. Fuck. Fucking, <laughs> fucking, fucking <laughs> Google <laughs> fucking fixing things. <laughs> they do manners at each other. <laughs> at one. <laughs> Another. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I like it. Sorry. <laughs> we discover that Denna is something of a prodigy her own damn self, but then oh no's. Here comes tall, handsome Savoy, who is not only a Chad, he is also Dennis Chad date for the evening. A love interest who is habitually unavailable isn't a trope either, is the thing we should remember, and neither is this chapter, which is pretty much over. <laughs> chapter 59, all this knowing. Quoth parties down. There is a fifth silence in the house, and it's outside and it's on the drunken stumble back to wizard campus <laughs> everyone knows they'll never grow old and die so easy chapter um encapsulates a lot about the delight of youth and camaraderie and nobody's going to die moving on oh yes yeah, I, I love it so much the they also know that they are friends and they share a certain love that will never leave them I remember that from nights like walking back to my buddy Jeff's house from like going out adventuring to girls' houses like literally a mile and a half, two and a half miles away like through the woods to get to their houses to, uh, to visit and like do teenage shit. It was great. Yeah, I kind of remember that uh, coming back from uh, explorations of the deep, deep desert with uh, some folks, you know. In the room? Yeah, but I'm talking about puberty <laughs> stuff, like back when you could still bone. Oh, I didn't get drunk when I was 15. No, 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 <laughs> but you could, <laughs> is the point. I was not getting drunk or having sex at 15, so this is a little odd for me. <laughs> well, to be fair, neither is Kvothe. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's getting real drunk. He's getting real mm -hmm. drunk. Yeah, and that's the part that I had in hand, too. Now... <laughs> If there would have been methylglen around, that would be a different story. Chapter 60, Fortune. Fortune. Quoth is hungover, but not so woozy that he doesn't spend half the day trying to sell his admissions exam slot for later in the week for one now, right now, today. Oh, that first hangover will fool you. You think that's what they're all going to be like? They're not all like that. My first one was the worst hangover I ever had. Sorry. Literally just, like, couldn't stand up, vomited, like, 80 times, could barely function. Then you, you did it right, Beth, if that was the worst one. That was absolutely Because I've seen you push yourself. <laughs> you used to have a nickname about how you pushed yourself. Go on. Quoth haggles with Ambrose for a pretty talent plus three, because we all debase ourselves on the great and terrible wheel of capital most days anyway. But wait, Quoth is making Ambrose look like the asshole he is for being willing to haggle in the first place, which is definitely below Ambrose's station. But payback is a bitch, we're told. But is it? Quoth eventually sells his slot to a decent chap for a reasonable amount plus a favor. Quoth's tuition is six talents, but he has a plan. Or does he? He it goes to the... Yes? Oh, I was just going to leave a joke on the table about... 
Quoth selling his slot. But please continue. Quoth's tuition is six talents, but he has a plan. Or does he? He goes to the Aeolian to grab his loot and schmoozes with Lord Threep du Threepington Dubois. Threep points out that etiquette is a set of rules people use so they can be rude to each other in public. Which, when you're a lord... <clears throat> to one another in public. After some back and forth, Threep... <laughs> What? Uh, well, did you make yourself what? angry? No, it says Thurp here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, autocorrect is literally your bane. No, I wrote this entire thing as Thurp, <laughs> and then I had like two chapters left to go the next day, and I read it, and I'm just like, Threep? No, I, wait, Threep? And then I go back, and I'm just like, Thurp, Thurp. Like, how did I write Thurp so many fucking times the other day? <laughs> when you're a lord, you can express that sort of opinion. That's what his privilege is. Threep is going to help Quoth find a patron. Quoth is thirsty for Denna, but no one can give him a lead. He goes to Debbie to do engagement in Lone Sharkery, and Debbie offers him use of her small magical library, and Quoth still doesn't know how flirting works or if not flirting at him. If I've learned anything in... Wow, deceased is not the right word for that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> no, read it as is, please. Okay. If I've learned anything in my deceased on the <laughs> if I've learned anything in my deceased on this earth, it's that you can always do nothing in the face of maybe flirting, and it always works out that way. <laughs> Existence. Wow! Yeah, like I'm were just you gonna... shouting this at your phone? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but I went back and I edited it. <laughs> Debbie offers him use of her small magical library, and Quoth still doesn't. Is that know a euphemism how... for something? <laughs> we, I don't know, and neither does Quoth. <laughs> he doesn't know how flirting works. I don't know how Maybe flirting works. Maybe that should be the uh, episode title for this chunk is Small Magical Library. <laughs> <laughs> Back at Wiz U, Quoth goes to Kilvin to rap about his debt to the fishery. Quoth loves him some artificing, and Kilvin appreciates that Quoth is going to keep making stuff there, even though being a music prodigy is so lucrative. Off to the inn to barter Quoth's talent pipes and loot prowess into room and board and a two-talent stipend. Talent, 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 talent. <laughs> talent is the buffalo of the King Killer Chronicle. <laughs> Quoth sees the light at the end of the tunnel of abject poverty and a hand-to-mouth existence. This is another one of those uh, relief for the character moments. Chapter 61, Jackass, Jackass. Quoth naps, works at the fishery, and hangs out over break. It's a whole new thing for him to relax so hard. He searches for Denna, but only finds the Threepster, who tells him Ambrose has been making sure Quoth isn't getting any royal patronage. They get drunk and unwise and write a simple, catchy, vulgar tune that is obviously about Ambrose, who is an ass, and we already know how dangerous songs can be. Ooh, nice rhyming. Yeah, it's another time that Quoth is safe and a song ruins everything. Mm -hmm. Quoth goes to the archives to see Master Lauren, but who we really see is Will and a Kaledish man who is another goddamned Amir and is armed to the tits. <laughs> or maybe he's a Conan the or maybe he's a Conan the Librarian Indiana Jones guy. Anyway. Quoth buys back his copy of Rhetoric and Logic from Master Lauren and apologizes for the whole fire in the stacks thing. So, can Quoth get some up in here back in here? Lauren is like, get the fuck out of here and come back when you figured out the whole prudence and patience thing. Quoth wakes the next day to find he is to be on the horns for writing an awesome song about a rich douche. The Chancellor is like, Ambrose, does your fizzle stick to pizzles? Ambrose is all, no. And the Chancellor gets his turn on the fuck out of here express. Quoth has to formally apologize in writing. <laughs> so he gets off pretty light. 
considering the last <sighs> time he was on the horns, he got a whipping. Not bad, official punishment-wise. Someone we don't know, but who almost certainly knows Ambrose, does a hostile takeover of Quoth's new in-home, and Quoth is like, I'll just find another in-home. But he can't find a place for work and board until luckily he meets a guy named Anchor of the... Until he meets a guy named Anker. Anker? Uh, Anker? It's, it's Anker. Until he meets a, <laughs> until he meets a guy named Anker of the eponymous Anchors Inn, who's like, fuck that guy and his bitchy wealth. <laughs> Quoth flyers the campus with his sarcastically sincere apology to Ambrose, and everything is going to get better, and there will be no lasting repercussions or any sort of consequences for this behavior, <laughs> not at all, nor from that song. We just know it. No, Scott Free. <laughs> No come up ends. Yeah, sometimes like I do things and I'm just like, oh, I know that I'm going to have to deal with this, but it's going to feel so good right now. Sometimes? <laughs> yeah, like not really in a big way in like the past two or three years. You're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Chapter 62, Leaves. Quoth works hard for his money in the fishery. The fishery which now contains a huge tank of hyper-caustic bone tar. Bone tar. Bone tar. In a giant foreshadowing container. <laughs> full of inflammable foreshadowing. <laughs> oh, you got to be careful with that foreshadowing. No, you do. It'll get all over yeah, the place. Yeah, because if you put that foreshadowing in a vial, it becomes a fire fog grenade. <laughs> I, I, am, I am so... You are so, so hard. Chekhov's fire fog I grenade was, right now. I really didn't want to go with Chekhov's fire fog. It's the only guy who has one. Literally, it's like two chapters from now. There's no act break. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Then it's a Deus Ex fire fog grenade. <laughs> This is this is very slightly look, foreshadowing. Look, man, I have totally had dates. This is like, like four on the date. I was like, look, yeah, I'll go on another date with you, and then like before that other date, like I blew myself up in a fire fog grenade accident. <laughs> 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 like you've you've been with me right after those dates. <laughs> You remember just after the divorce. There was a lot of <laughs> we all remember just after the divorce. There was like six dates, and then I got two girlfriends. <laughs> Quoth is going to use it to make better sympathy lamps. He can sell for more money so he can pay more of his debts as well as his living expenses and slowly, inch by fucking inch, claw his way out of poverty. Y'all ever done that? It sucks. Still working on it. Anyone not know that? Everyone knows that. Okay, moving on. Find our Patreon at FunKillerPod at Patreon.com or however you make those addresses. Anyone wa want to buy a truck that doesn't run? It's in front of the house. Getting tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Later, Quoth is playing at Anchors, and here's Denna. Quoth is going to cut out from his troubadour duties, but first... Troubadour duties? Yes. Done. Quoth is going to cut out from his Truba duties, but first he plays Tinker Taylor, which everyone joins in on. He sneaks away while they're all still singing at each other, and he and Denna get to walk and talk and do this weird car game where you tell someone what flower you would bring them. Incidentally, I'm a chrysanthemum. Um, Denna does not think she's a sealess flower, and Quoth is a willow flower um, because That's name of the wind. Yeah, but trees have flowers. Some sure. some trees have flowers. Yeah, willow uh, trees don't. Rex, um, if you were a flower, what flower would you be? Pitcher plant. Is that flower? Ostentatious, but I'll allow it. Yeah. yeah. Carnivorous flower. Do you have a pretentious flower? Oh, uh, mine would be that weird long series of yellow flowers that come out of succulents. It's like a big giant penis oh, flower. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those Ooh. are great. Yeah. 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 Startling, yeah, inappropriate, and only a few times a year. Mm -hmm. Also wild daga, but only because it kind of gets you high, so I've heard. And it's really pretty. And it kind of gets you high, so I've heard. And I was lying about being a chrysanthemum. I'm not a chrysanthemum. I'm that flower that smells like rotting meat like once every five years. The 
Seven years. The corpse flower? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's right. I got thick petals. <laughs> <laughs> Both is a willow flower because name of the wind and because no one knows when to kiss someone for the first time, which is why you have to get comfortable asking for consent. Aw. Chapter 63, Walking and Talking. Quoth ditched out on his friends last night to hang with Denna. Thusly and forthwith do Quoth's friends provide him with more shit. It really kind of humanizes Quoth how much his friends give him shit in the face of how superhero he is. He's also like two years younger than him. So, you know, they, they've got to do something to put this kid in his place. Oh, so they're younger brothering him. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, they really like him. Yeah. And you only really abuse those you love most deeply. Disagree. And then, Kvothe gets a little butthurt over the gang ridiculing him for being a shy boy instead of a fuck boy. And that's the chapter. Oh, come on, gang. I'm just saving myself for marriage. Like the Jonas Brothers. Chapter 64, Nine in the Fire. Kvothe, thirsty for Denna again, goes searching Imri for Denna. He thinks he knows where she's staying... But it's never that easy when you're trying to find Denna. And he never finds her. Night after night after night. And if this wasn't the behavior of an honorable protagonist, I'd say his behavior was creepy as fuck. But no, no, no. He, he's not stalking her. It's, it's, it's just like a real life game of Where's Waldo. I, I get that there's no cell phones back then. but <laughs> Sometimes you just, you know, pace around campus looking for that cute human. Uh-huh. You, you have every reason in the world to buy six cups of coffee every day from the same coffee shop because maybe she'll be on shift. But what's not creepy is how good Kvothe is at engineering a sympathy lamp. It's not a standard model, but it does have a rheostat, which is a word I've never gotten out of my head since I learned it when I was a little kid. It's a great word. It is. I, I relish every opportunity to talk about rheostat, or even better, rheostatic. Mm -hmm. mm. Wait, rheostatic is a word? Yeah. I know rheostat, so for our listeners who do not know, rheostat is a way that you dim lighting. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually specifically a way that it, it is a resistant way of dimming lighting. So when you turn that little knob, you're turning up a resistor uh, that dims the lighting. Uh, it's... It's kind of neat, mm -hmm. but it's rheostatic. It just means like a rheostat control controls lighting rheostatically. It's just a... Uh oh It's just a verb. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, gotcha. Way less fun than I was hoping for. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Both made a lamp with a dimmer switch. It's just got an extra syllable. A flashlight. It, you can point it in one direction. Yeah, and Kilvin admonishes Kvothe for that because flashlights are only used for tricksy business. Yeah, because people didn't camp in those days. Camping wasn't something you did for fun. It's something you did after your um, family was burned to death by the Chandrian. <laughs> okay. Fair. <laughs> but maybe you would have been better off with a flashlight. <laughs> well... I am going to say that up until we got LED flashlights, flashlights were pretty bullshit and would not illuminate an area nearly as much as a lantern would. And yeah. what this is, is a lantern that you can focus to just a spot. And that's going to find its way into the hands of people who are going to use that for malfeasance. By the way, I picture this lantern to be like one of those um, utility lights. What are the lights? The... The giant, uh, one of the ones that takes like 4D batteries. Mag lights? Mag lights. Ah. And it's, you can focus it to a tiny point and you can make kind of spread. But really what it is, is for bashing people's heads in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Nobody wants this it, flashlight for illuminating It's shit. a billy club that can also really mess up somebody's eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. That's how I picture, uh, Quoth's first mm -hmm. lamp. Mm -hmm. So we all agree that all cops are bastards. Please continue. Yes. Well, I was going to continue with Kilvin doesn't like that one bit, but I'm pretty sure Kilvin knows exactly what cops are. <laughs> Kilvin admonishes Kvothe for making a lantern for Trixie business, and Kilvin doesn't like that one bit. But it is a well-made lamp, and Kvothe's artificer job rank increases to journeyman. 
So this has really got to be like a classless system. You, you cannot have a class-based system and have him cross-classing so many skills. It's, it's not ridiculous. A cl- it's a job system. Yeah. You can have a lot of jobs. You can level up those jobs separately. You can't have all of those jobs equipped at once. But once you level up enough, I bet you can have more than one of those jobs at the same time. It, those systems have a lot of space for uh, like creativity, but uh, I, I think they tend to get a little Monty Hall as per our protagonist can't be good at everything stop making references to monty hall <clears throat> monty hall was the um host of let's make a deal uh god you guys are old <laughs> no i'm not old i said don't make a reference that i didn't get beth uh it is a uh, slang in pen and paper role-playing game for making a character that is all power no flaws also sometimes used uh when the Game master is making all the monsters easy to kill and giving you lots of treasure. Uh, so Monty Hall is like nerfing shit. Uh, yes, Mon- Monty Hall is playing the game on easy mode. Okay, but it is a well-made lamp, and quotes artificer job rank increases to journeyman. After a short aside with Manet, wherein Manet will not tell Quoth how to sneak into the archives, Quoth returns to Kilvin's office for a request. Since that lamp is too devious to be sold. Uh, can I has? And Kilvin is like, here, it's yours. Don't let it out of your sight. You paid for it. And Quoth you is like. You made it. It's yours. And Quoth is all like, yay, I'm a break into the archives. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 65, Spark. Quoth makes money at the Aeolian by not drinking the drinks he's offered at the Aeolian. He uses that credit to buy some fancy booze to celebrate his new journeyman status with Will and Sim. And, it turns out, an emerald dress swaddled Denna. Swaddled, the sexiest word you can use when talking about a beautiful woman. (laughs) Denna and Quoth ditch the boy wonders, grab a hobo picnic of bread and fruit wine, and settle down to a long night of staring into each other's eyes and being awkwardly cute with each other. Well, Quoth is awkward. It's all very sweet, and they make plans to meet up the next day. Hours pass, and Quoth returns to the Aeolian alone. He is warned off that Denna is like a viper made of fire that lives in your pocket, and she'll only burn you up and burn you out. But Quoth is like, nah, I'm fine. That's not a metaphor. He's elated, (laughs) and he has plans to see her tomorrow. Every time we end a chapter on a positive note, Chapter 66, Volatile. Dun, dun, dun. Quoth is up early and off to work at the fishery to quell his nerves. He decides to make magic blue totally not LEDs today for some baller sympathy lamps. He does all the right things to decant the dangerously corrosive bone tar. It's weird. The canister is all cold, but oh well. Quoth has things to do and he's going to do them and... The state of the canister is really not under my purview. No, no, you got to keep it cold. If you don't keep it cold, boom, splody. A couple hours and one holy fucking shit, oh no. Later, the table with the frosty reservoir of caustic, flammable, horrifying bone tar collapses. The reservoir shatters. And through some nifty design of the artificery, there's two rivers of bone tar flowing toward and trapping Fila in a corner of the artificery. Quoth immediately saves the day through blood magic, ingenuity, and the young, stupid bravery of a young buck. And he passes out, which is also a thing he does immediately after he's heroic a lot. Um, But this time he didn't cry. No, this time he didn't cry. It's also a thing I like to do after I suck down ammonia fumes and burn the shit out of my legs. Mm -hmm. Uh, Passing out, it's it's a good next option. Yeah, but he's always passing out. He's just a pass out boy. He he takes a lot of... Horrific injuries. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. This may be the first time he's passed out and not gotten a concussion act. <laughs> <laughs> that we know of. <laughs> um, so he passes out, wakes up in Medica, and uh, he has already missed his date with Denna. He rushes to meet her at the Aeolian after being discharged from Medica, but she has already bounced, of course. Quoth heads back to Anchors, dejected. He sits by himself has some soup, and realizes the people around him are talking about his heroics, and then some. 
It turns out you don't always have to embellish your own tales, do you? You don't. No, sometimes you can just uh, almost die horrifically. Chapter 67. Next time, chapter 67. Good job, DD. Wow, you made it all the, the way through. Stopping at the appropriate place. I'm Bolded so proud 67 of you. for next time. Bolded. Well, thank you for reminding us that we skipped a chapter this time. And thank you for walking us through that summary of chapters through 66. <laughs> Uh. King killer, king killer, <laughs> king killer, king killer. Mm-hmm. Ooh, uh, just just a just a pinch flat there on the end, just just a little bit. Oh, it felt flat the whole way yeah. through. That's why I really <laughs> leaned into it at the end. Mm. Oh. I'll crunched over this table. You want my pipes? I'll stand. I'll stand. I'll give pipes. Beth, you want my pipes? We're talking about pipes now.